How to Talk So an Alcoholic Will Listen, a Practical Guide to Improve Communication. It's in the interest of anyone who deals with an alcoholic or addict on a regular basis to learn to communicate with them in such a way that he or she is likely to understand and respond appropriately. That can be quite a challenge. If you think of addiction as a brain disorder that affects the way people think, feel, and behave, it's easier to see why. Nonetheless, there are guidelines we can follow that will reduce the potential for conflict and chaos and provide a better basis for intervention when the time is right. What follows here is an overview of the challenges and some practical suggestions for making things turn out better. There is no perfect solution, but our actions can make a real difference. Remember that the effects of addiction linger for quite a while after drinking and drug use finally stop, so these suggestions can help you there, too. The addicted brain shouldn't be treated as a normal brain because it isn't functioning in that fashion. Uh, during the active addiction, you're dealing with a cycle of intoxication and withdrawal that affects behavior, which can, in many cases, be determined by how far away the alcoholic is from his last drink or how close he is to his next one. Even in recovery, we're dealing with protracted withdrawal symptoms uh, that can influence behavior there as well. Augmented emotion simply refers to the alcoholic's heightened emotional state. It's pretty simple for anxiety to slip into panic. It's easy for disappointment to turn into depression or frustration into rage. There's a particularly hyperactive fight-flight response. It's easy for an alcoholic or addict to feel threatened and to overreact to what looks to you like ordinary stress. Sleep disruption is very common in addiction, and it's thought to be cumulative. In other words, if you lose a, um, an hour a night of uh, good sleep, it's the equivalent of losing uh, a night a week. Imagine that over months or years, and you can see how it could affect behavior. Uh, memory deficits are usually short-term, what's called post-distractional. In other words, uh, when there's an intervening period where the alcoholic or addict was thinking about something else, uh, he or she is likely to have forgotten all or part of a previous conversation. Mood swings are so dramatic in some alcoholics uh, that they're mislabeled as having bipolar disorder. Um, the swings can be quite rapid, and it makes it difficult to predict behavior, even, uh, you know, during a single day. And, of course, obsessive thinking. Uh, alcoholics and addicts are known uh, for not being able to let go or relax, uh, particularly of a resentment. When I say resentment, I mean a situation where the alcoholic feels he or she was uh, victimized or taken advantage of or discriminated against, can just fester in the brain for, for extended periods. Uh, alcoholics and addicts can be sensitive and easily offended, and importantly, they tend to project their feelings onto others and misread their attentions. Some suggestions for better communication uh, with an alcoholic or addict. One, learn to speak with some authority. This is largely a matter of planning out what you're going to say before you say it. The more important the topic of discussion, the more essential it is to plan out what you're going to say. Start by asking yourself, what do I hope to gain from this interaction? If it's just, I'll feel better getting it off my chest, you may want to reconsider. Addicts tend to escalate in conflict, and you might find yourself with more problems than you started with. Make sure you mean what you say. Uh, don't uh, make threats that you don't intend to carry out or promises that you have no intention of keeping. The second suggestion, be willing to make the first positive move. Uh, take advantage of the principle of reciprocity, which in simple terms is, if I do something good for you, you will feel an urge to do something good for me in return. It's possibly the strongest principle of human interaction. Make a habit of doing something positive for the other person. Now, that doesn't mean to rescue them. It does mean look for opportunities to engender some goodwill and trust in the relationship. Try not to hold grudges, partly because the alcoholic and the addict is probably holding so many of them. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things that addicts or alcoholics do that we don't like, uh, that have a negative impact on us. And uh, it's tempting to 
create a sort of backlog of resentments uh, that color your interactions. Try to avoid that. Um, most of what the alcoholic or addict does during the active addiction is dictated by the addiction rather than some deep-rooted uh, hatred of you. So um, try to remember that and act accordingly. The third suggestion is to avoid arguments. This is a founding principle of motivational enhancement, and I think it's a good one. If things do get hot in a discussion, break it off temporarily. Timeouts can save a relationship. The idea that um, you can out-escalate an alcoholic or addict uh, just doesn't hold water. Uh, they can escalate to a level that will make things uncomfortable for everybody. You want to reduce the overall tension in a relationship by giving everybody a chance to cool down. The fourth suggestion, demonstrate empathy. Empathy is the capacity to understand another's viewpoint, even if it's quite different from your own. Reflective listening simply involves repeating back somebody's message to make sure it's clear to both of you doesn't mean you have to agree or to discount your own point of view. It just means you listened and took the time to understand. Now the fifth suggestion is to make options clearer with contrast. To emphasize something, contrast it with something else. Counselors do this when they say, well, maybe you should consider a halfway house. On the other hand, uh, there's a homeless shelter. It makes the first option look a lot better. With addicts and alcoholics, you want to limit the options in order to facilitate a decision. In other words, instead of saying, you really need to um, tell me what you'd like to do in this situation, give them option A and option B. <coughs> Excuse me. And that'll make it easier for them to decide. Suggestion six, be willing to provide factual evidence. Expect to be challenged as to your opinion. Uh, be ready for it. Don't count on the alcoholic to recall incidents the way you do. Those memory deficits may play a role. Suggestion seven, be willing to explain your reasoning. Addicts tend to see differences as rooted in personality, so you want to reframe the discussion in rational terms. I don't know how many times I've had an alcoholic say to me, well, she's just trying to get back at me. When I say, well, what would be her motive for that, I'll get an answer like, well, how would I know? I'm not her. It's an assumption the alcoholic makes that you're operating out of some strange psychological kink of your own. By providing your reasoning, you minimize uh, the alcoholic's tendency to attribute differences to personality conflict. Suggestion eight, seek smaller commitments. This is a uh, common sense uh, practice used in 12-step programs. Um, the day at a time slogan. You can do things in smaller chunks that you never imagined you could accomplish as a whole. Be willing to ask for verbal or written commitments where needed uh, to avoid those gaps in memory which create conflict later. Uh, make sure everybody's clear on exactly what's been agreed upon. Suggestion nine, reward success. The biggest outcomes are built of small successes, and it never hurts to recognize even a minor achievement with praise. Um, we're sometimes so concerned with punishing bad behavior associated with addiction that we forget to recognize that good stuff is still happening, and yet that's a motivator too. It doesn't constitute wholesale approval of the alcoholic's behavior to offer praise, just recognition that there is good there. The biggest suggestion we can make is to manage your expectations. There's really no point in setting your hopes on something you're very unlikely to achieve. Uh, to guard against this, use others as sounding boards. Say to someone you trust, uh, do a, does it sound like I'm being realistic here? Is my expectation excessive? Uh, should I modify it? I like this quote. I don't know where it came from, but uh, unrealistic expectations are just premeditated resentments. So unless you have a, a need to feel disappointed, it's best to avoid them. And finally, we close the slide presentation with a reminder that recovery is learned. The more we practice it, the better we're going to get.